In this short video, I'll show how you can quickly convert a cheap drill motor like this one for use in a robot or something like a remote controlled rover. I assume most of you are familiar with the basic design of a cordless drill. There's the chuck for holding the drill, and then between the chuck and the motor, you'll typically see a clutch system like this one for adjusting the torque output of the motor. The motor we're going to convert today came from a cheap single speed drill. And as you can see, the chuck and clutch control system have already been removed from that main motor assembly. When selecting a drill for this purpose, you want to look for a cordless drill at a low price because there is much better motor options if money is not an issue. These drill motors serve as a budget friendly but very effective option. In Australia where I am, think along the lines of Azito power tools. In America, probably something like Drillmaster or Harbor Freight would be the equivalent. I'm sure there's lots of other brands making cheap cordless drills, but the key thing is we want something cheap, single speed, cordless and one that ideally contains metal gears. You may have to look at a few different options depending on what you have available locally to rule out those with plastic gears. Plastic gears will still work of course but in robotics where you're likely going to be throttling and applying maximum torque a lot there are scenarios where plastic gears will just simply shred and leave your robot dead in the water. And so given the intention is to use these motors for robotics we essentially want the motor to deliver all of its available torque or brake trying. Although this motor has been stripped of its chuck and clutch system, it can't be used like this. If I turn the shaft, note that it turns freely as the internal gears aren't being engaged because it no longer has its clutch system. To fix this, we'll need to lock the clutch so that all of the potential power is delivered directly to the output shaft. And with all that said, Let's get started. Using a screwdriver, we can remove these screws from the back of the clutch or the transmission case. There may be more screws or in a different configuration on your drill motor, but either way, the first step is to remove those screws so that we can separate the case like this. You can see that there are two stages of gears and a pinion gear on the back of this plate. The second stage gears are slightly thicker as they have to be able to handle more torque. As I said before, we need to lock the clutch, and to do that, I'll be using grub or set screws in these holes that originally housed ball bearings. These are the grub screws I'll be using. Don't worry too much about the specific thread or length. Get what you can, or use what you have already on hand, perhaps, but make sure that they're long enough to screw through the hole and make contact with this plate. The goal is to prevent any slipping of the clutch mechanism, ensuring that the motor's power is always fully transferred to the gear train. And these little ridges on the bottom of the ring gear is what provides the clutching action. The grub screws will sit between these ridges here, and we want them to go in just enough to stop it from spinning, but not so far that it locks and binds up the whole gearbox, essentially stopping it from moving at all. You might get away without tapping these holes and simply forcing the grub screws to thread themselves through the plastic, but I don't recommend that. To do this properly, we should tap these holes first, and so you will need to have the tap that corresponds with the thread on whatever grub screws you've selected for this project. I don't like to tap the holes while the motor casing's still assembled, as it can push bits of plastic into the casing, which then sticks and binds itself to the grease coating those internal gears. I think it's better to take an extra minute just to disassemble the gear case, tap the holes, remove any bits of plastic that make their way into the casing, and then reassemble it before installing the grub screws. Now, I'm tapping these holes from the outside in. You could also do this from the inside out in the hope that more of the plastic scraps are pushed out and away from the internals. It's easy enough just to run a pick around the outside and use some of that excess grease to pick up all the bits of plastic and then wipe it on a rag. Reassembly is straightforward. First, we'll drop the ring gear back in place. Then we can place the three thicker second stage gears back in place as well with one on each pin. I'll give it a quick spin here just to make sure that nothing is binding up. Then we need to drop the carrier plate back in with those first stage gears. And the motor mount housing has a tab that aligns with a corresponding pin. And as you rotate the case back into place, you'll feel it connect and seat back into its correct position. Now we can put the screws back in to complete the main assembly. 
The next step is to lock that clutch by screwing the grub screws into each of the holes that we just tapped. I've started a grub screw in all eight holes here, then I'm putting a drop or two of Loctite on each of the threads before screwing them into place. You'll feel when the grub screw bottoms out as they come into contact with that ring gear that we saw before. Once that happens, you can back them off about quarter to half a turn on each one. You can adjust the tension so that there is no play at all in the shaft. This can help in robotics as when you apply the throttle, the delay between stop and start is reduced slightly. You can play around with this yourself and figure out what works for your purpose. For lightweight applications, two or four grub screws may actually be enough. But if this is going to be used for something like combat robots or something that's heavy weight, for the price of a few extra grub screws, it's worth going with eight as I'm doing here. The shaft is now locked on the motor, as you can see here, and that's the hardest part done. The final step is just to work on cleaning up the terminals and getting the motor ready to be wired in place wherever you plan to use it. So to do that, I'll first clean up the terminals by removing the old wires and removing most of the old solder. I'm placing a 1 microfarad ceramic capacitor rated to 50 volts for noise suppression across the positive and negative terminal. There are other capacitors you could use for this purpose, but be mindful when selecting one that the voltage rating is high enough for your 12 or 18 volt motor. This motor has a red mark here indicating positive and also had a black and red wire attached to begin with, so figuring out polarity was easy. I've stripped insulation from the ends of the wires that I plan to connect to these terminals and I'm using that stripped insulation on the legs of the capacitor just to make sure that it's insulated from the metal motor case. With the capacitor bridging the two terminals we can then solder a wire to the positive terminal and another wire to the negative terminal. Finally I'm securing those wires to the motor with a cable tie which just helps to provide some strain relief for those terminal connections. And that's it, a drill motor fully prepared for use in a robot. One final word of advice is that when you're tearing your donor drill apart, Make sure to keep the screw that secures the chuck to the motor shaft as this will be useful for attaching wheels and the like. The screw has a reverse thread and is not cheap to replace so best to keep the original. I'll be uploading a few more videos in this series just showing you how to attach a wheel to these motors, how to mount the motor and wheel assembly to something like a basic platform and how you can drive them via remote control. So if you haven't already, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you'd like to see more content like this soon. Alright, that's it.